International Seminary. And today we're in this digital platform because unfortunately we can't uh, meet each other in person, which would have been really amazing for this uh, seminar of this type of characteristics, since we have such great comrades that are going to be accompanying us in this process um, during throughout the whole seminar. Um, but it will be still an amazing process and that we can continue this process and hopefully do it in a presential way in some time. So thank you so much for connecting the people who are the general public and the people who are part of the, uh, the, the conference. Uh, we know their organizations and through the different platforms. And so it's an honor for us for the organizing committee to be organizing this seminar with more than 780 people in, uh, registered. We can't even believe how many people are here. It's such an honor to have you all here. And thank you so much. Just wanted to share this. And we will welcome you to this first class. And so for the people who are watching us, so we know that you're from different groups and all of the different groups that are participating have a different um, dynamic. And so there are people who are going to be, um, who are delegated from the organizations and there are people who will be just following the biography and are gonna be part of the live transmissions. And so I wanted to explain about this initiative and who's behind it. So we, this is called the New Interventions, uh, Geopolitics of Latin America and the Caribbean. And so this is organized by four spaces. Um, and so we have been all working together for a long time. And so today we came together to design this um, seminar for all of you. And so now I'm gonna present the different organizations that are part of this. And so they're comrades from uh, Battle of Ideas, which is a um, publishing house in Argentina that's for the people. And so they publish books about critical thought and to contribute to uh, different authors and researchers from Latin America and the world and, and share what they have been um, researching and writing. And so they're also part of this course. And so we also have comrades from the Jose Mar Carlos Mariategui Political Education School. And so they're located in the province of Buenos Aires outside of La Plata. And they have been developing uh, spaces of political education um, in Latin America for the different people's organizations um, within Argentina and across the continent. And so they believe political education is a fundamental priority for political organization. And so the Jose Carlos Mariategui Political Education School is also part of this space that we're organizing today. And they're part of the political pedagogical coordination. And then we also have the comrades from the tricontinental Institute for Social Research, which many of you already know. Um, we were all in the launch of the Washington Bullets launch um, by BJ Prashad, which is part of the Tricontinental Institute. And so this is a space that's dedicated to social research, um, to be researching from a class perspective, to be addressing problems of the people of the world. And they have different offices across the global south. And they have the priority to uh, raise awareness to the realities of the people of the, the continents. And so this is not only tricontinental, but also it's uh, in the focus, but because of the, you know, where they're located. And so today we have the director of tricontinental, uh, Vijay Prashad. And Alba Movements. And Alba Movements is a space that is uh, transmitting uh, this panel in Spanish. And we will also be transmitting this in English through the Tricontinental Platform. Alba Movements is a platform of social movements across Latin America and the Caribbean. They have been working many years bringing together movements across the region. They're convinced that through uh, political education, we will be able to form and, um, and create questions about um, militancy, about social commitment, about social justice. And this is our task as organizations. So it's not only our task to understand the world, but also to transform it. And so political education for Alba movements is a very important task of the organization. And we believe that also coming together and encountering each other and meeting each other is a very important space. So from all of our organizations, battle of ideas, 
Star Continental, Jose Carlos Mariategui and other movements. Uh, this is our honor to be here today. So today, Lautaro is gonna explain a little bit more. Today is our first day, September 17th. And every single Thursday, we will have live transmissions. This time was one hour earlier, but all of the other times will be at 6 p.m. Argentina. And all of the topics that we're going to be addressing are gonna be linked to the theme of this seminar. So about imperialism, geopolitics, and the resistance of the people in our continent. And now we're gonna do the closing of this sem seminar on November 26th, which will be the closing with different comrades that are part of internationalist pro processes. Now that you know, so all the people who are part of this uh, course know all of the dates. So on my behalf, I give you, I welcome you. And it's an honor to be here from all the movements. Um, all of the people are coming from the movements from Latin America and the Caribbean and welcome to this experience. I think we're all going to enjoy it a lot. So now I'm gonna give the hand, hand it over to Lautaro. Hey, good afternoon, comrades. So we wanted to share with you from the organizing team a bit about the pro political proposal of this seminar. So one part of it is about analyzing the strategy of North American imperialism in the region. This is an empire that has been reinforcing its uh, uh, geopolitical hegemony over the last couple of years and has been ten testing out new forms of coups within the region uh, using sanctions, uh, economic war, and using uh, sexual violence, the media corporations, the paramilitary forces, and using uh, right, uh, far-right religious forces. So we believe that med this meddling in the region has a very specific intention and it also has a cultural aspect. And so we, we see the, um, the efforts put by the nonprofits and by the cultural industry of the United States. So this is why it's not surprising for us, but it does make us worried about all of these conceptions of the liberal and colonial ideas that, in, that try to demobilize our people. And this, you know, generates a lot of confusion among our people. And so we believe that the best way to combat all of the mis these misconceptions is having critical thought. And so this is why I believe we wanted to take on the, the best um, traditions of thought within our peoples of the global south, of our peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. And so this is why our first class will be with some of the best representatives of this tradition of thought. So we're talking about the uh, Indian intellectual Vijay Prashad. We're talking about the French activist Mireille Fanon and then also the great philosopher of the peoples of the South, Enrique Dussel. So we said that it would be important to address the crisis uh, about the virtual learning. And so sometimes it's hard to distinguish um, what is a coup uh, a popular rebellion, a internal crisis or economic war. And so we see this happening, of course, with uh, the United States against Venezuela. So we think it's important to be able to recognize and distinguish all of these different elements. And so when we see, for example, uh, we also believe that there's a crisis when we are unable to be able to identify which are the states that are violating human rights that have links with narco traffickers, with paramilitaries like we see in Colombia. And we believe when we're in a crisis, when we cannot distinguish um, the crisis of uh, political, of peace process. And we see this with um, Haiti. And this is why we believe that we're lacking a lot of um, take, adopting the theoretical tool, tools to be able to analyze these situations. And for this reason, we're doing this seminar and we're going through very tough times because especially of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
a big economic crisis, the neoliberal economic model. And of course, we're in a very uncertain crisis with the violation of rights across the world in the tricontinental dossier. There's a really great article in the uh, intellectual, critical intellectuals and who educates the, the militant intellectuals. And so we need to see within militants and social leaders and that we educate each other and that we're able to build this thought. So with no more preamble, we're going to give the mic over to Vijay Prashad, historian, journalist. He is the um, editor in chief of Leftward Books and the director of Tricontinental Institute of Social Research, as Laura Compton said before. And so he's also part of the uh, Shanghai Institute and he has written many books including Washington Bullets, which was recently published by Battle of Ideas in Argentina with a introduction from Evo Morales. Welcome Vijay Prashad. Um, thank you so much, Lautoro. Uh, every time I'm in Argentina, I threaten that I'll try out my Spanish this time. Uh, this time I'm definitely not going to try because the concepts I'm going to share are too complicated for me to try in any other language. So I'm grateful to Zoe and Facundo, our superb translators for um, making me understandable to many of you. I'm going to share with you four concepts. The concepts are imperialism, globalization, socialism, and hybrid war. And the way I'm going to talk about these four concepts is through the very dangerous situation currently in the South China Sea with the United States immense military capacity, including its most fierce armored carriers, ships going up and down the South China Sea, provoking China creating the possibility of a serious clash in the waters around Asia. The United States bringing India, Australia, and Japan into the Quad, Q-U-A-D, Quadrilateral Security Arrangement. This Quad has provoked India and China into a clash where soldiers have been killed in the high mountains near Tibet. This is a very serious situation right now for the world. That's why I'm part of a group called No Cold War. And you must visit our website at nocoldwar.org. We have a seminar coming up on the 24th of September, where we're going to talk again with great seriousness about what's happening around China. So using the story of US imposed hybrid war on China, I'm going to explain the categories of globalization, imperialism, socialism, and hybrid war. So this presentation will have four sections, and I hope to be finished in half an hour. That's what it is. So I hope that's okay. Um, here we go. The first thing to explain is the rise of China. How should we understand this? There's a lot of misinformation about the rise of China. Part of the information war conducted by the West has been the suggestion that China is an imperialist. China is being a colonial power in Africa. China's entry into South America is imperialism. It's very interesting, comrades. It's very interesting that it's the United States and the Europeans who are talking about the Chinese as imperialists. When today in Mozambique, in Uganda, the French energy company Total is creating mayhem for the people of Northern Mozambique, for the people of Uganda, immense human rights and natural disasters created not by the Chinese, but by the French. What is the French military doing in Mali? What are they doing in Niger? What are they doing across the Sahel? 
the french don't want to talk about the french in africa in order not to talk about the french in africa they prefer to talk about the chinese in africa the belgians who destroyed the congo will sniff and moan about the chinese doing this and that till now they have never apologized for what they've done in the congo never the united states government which is attempting to overthrow the bolivarian revolution in venezuela which has continued to attack the cuban revolution which participated with the worst elements in bolivia to overthrow our brother comrade evo morales in bolivia the united states which has had an active imperialist policy has through its media outlets said china is imperialist be careful what you read and what you say when you listen to what they are saying and then you just repeat what they are saying your brain has been left behind you are not thinking independently you are just becoming a mouthpiece of cnn which is a mouthpiece of the us state department currently that means that you are a puppet of mike pompeo of all horrible people to become a puppet of that's who you become if you're not thinking carefully how do we understand the rise of china on october 1st the chinese will celebrate national day on the 1st of october 1949 is the day they honor their revolution the chinese revolution when the chinese people rose up defeated the japanese aggressors defeated their own bourgeoisie defeated the kuomintang and so on and came to power the first thing to recognize is that all our socialist experiments from the bolshevik october revolution against the tsar's empire 1917 from then till the cuban revolution 1959 till the revolution in burkina faso led by captain thomas sankara 1983 all these revolutions for socialism have taken place in poor parts of the world in the poorer nations not one revolution has taken place inside europe not one revolution in northern america germany never had a bolshevik revolution however much marx wanted that england never had a bolshevik revolution it was the poorer countries that broke through broke what lenin called the weakest link that's where the revolutions happened from 1949 to 1978 for that long period of 29 years the chinese communists attempted to create socialism in their country they made some terrible mistakes because they were struggling to create socialism in a poor country they made some terrible mistakes but at the same time they lifted the standard of life for ordinary chinese people hunger started to go illiteracy started to go healthcare problems started to go you see i was born in india indian independence happened in 1947 2 years before china if you compare hunger if you compare literacy if you compare healthcare in india and china both countries with a similar population of 1.4 billion people if you compare these two countries today they had the independence around the same time if you compare these two countries china is miles in another direction than india india is a country where half the population struggles with hunger literacy rates much lower than china so despite the fact that it was a poor country in those 29 odd years till 1978 their indicators improved despite the fact that they were struggling to build socialism amidst poverty in 1978 the government in china decided it's time to have some reforms because the they feared the leadership in the communist party i think correctly feared that in technological terms in scientific terms china was behind the capitalist bloc chinese technology was struggling and they looked and saw in the soviet union there was a similar struggle they watched technological improvements take place in the capitalist bloc and said cannot allow ourselves to be defeated by the capitalists on technology 
So they opened their economy. Those are the 1978 reforms. They opened their economy, but with a very clear agenda, not to become capitalists, but to bring technology in. So when you look at the deals Chinese companies struck with foreign companies, they always said, if you want to come and build a factory in Shenzhen, you have to transfer two things. You have to transfer the technology and you have to transfer science because they understood a transfer of technology is a short term gain. When you learn technology, you just learn how to make, say, an iPhone today. You need to learn science because science is a long term advantage. If you're scientifically able to develop things, you can always develop tech. But science gives you the foundation for technological advances. So the Chinese in 1978 began to draw science and tech into the country, put a lot of effort in this area. This is very key to the advances we've seen in China in the last 20 years. The arrival of science and tech had allowed the Chinese to create quite sophisticated firms owned and run often by the state. Now, let me give you an example. The Chinese welcomed German and French companies that built wind turbines, green energy, you know, big windmills and so on. These the companies that had developed these the most advanced were the French and the Germans. Chinese said you can manufacture wind turbines inside China, but give us the technology, give us the science. Today, Chinese companies are the world's largest developers, not just producers, by the way. I want to be clear about one thing. China is no longer just a manufacturer of goods that are developed in the West. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. China is an initiator of goods that they produce. In other words, they have developed goods. These are not new wind turbines developed in the West that the Chinese now produce. The Chinese are developing the next generation of wind turbine because in scientific and technological terms, they have leapfrogged over many of the Western companies. So in terms of wind turbine, as an example, the Chinese are ahead of the West. Now, I want to pause for a minute here and come to the second point. So the first point is the road to socialism in the so-called realm of necessity in the poorer parts of the world. The road to socialism is very complicated. You know, countries like Laos and Vietnam, which has suffered terrible bombing by the United States, you know, for over a generation. These countries were poor, had been destroyed by war. You know, Cuba, when our brothers and sisters took power in 1959 in Cuba, um, they faced a situation where, you know, the professionals fled the island, capital fled the island, American companies had dominated the entire country. It was a poor country. They had to struggle with great dignity to produce a socialism in their society. It was not a wealthy country that they built you know, into a socialist country. They had to struggle. So the first point about socialism is socialism isn't a made-to-order idea. You don't just bring it off the shelf. Socialism is a struggle. It is part of the international class struggle. In Venezuela, what is being conducted is an international class struggle to produce a socialist society. It's not a socialist society today. They're struggling on the terms of capitalism to produce a different society. And that's precisely what you see in China. There are, as Frederick Engels said quite carefully, there are zigs and zags because we are human beings trying to create a different world. We'll make lots of mistakes. And don't let the capitalist bloc take our mistakes and confuse us. We need to understand that there are zigs and zags in the history of socialism. There will be lots of mistakes. That's because we're human beings. Be careful in how you judge these experiments because it's not easy to conduct and build socialism in a poor country. That's the first point. Second point, globalization. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, and for many reasons, and I want you to go to the Tricontinental website and read a document we have there called In the Ruins of the Present, because what I'm going to present here is basically a summary of that. In the period after the Soviet Union had collapsed, 
there were new technological developments, satellites, the ability to move goods through container ships. There was computerization of inventories and so on. So firms were able to break factories up and spread the one factory across the globe. This is a term that we use called disarticulation of production. The translator's name is Facundo. I think Facundo is translating for me. When I was in Rosario, the city of Che Guevara in Argentina, I was talking about the disarticulation of production. Facundo was my translator there and he remembers the term. So hopefully Facundo, there is an easy way to translate that phrase, disarticulation of production. All it means is the breaking up of factories, breaking up of one factory into little components around the world. Now, the capitalist bloc understood that if you do that to a factory, you're susceptible to having your intellectual property stolen by other people. Because if you're asking, say, somebody in Malaysia to make printed circuit boards for a computer monitor, then the factory in Malaysia knows how a printed circuit board is made and they can make another factory and start making it and don't pay you rent anymore. They don't pay you money. They just make printed circuit boards. In order to protect themselves against that, the capitalist bloc changed the law as far as intellectual property rights were concerned. Previously, intellectual property rights were guaranteed based on the process of production. So how you made something was patented. In other words, if I'm making a medicine, the final medicine couldn't be patented in the old days. Only the way in which you made the medicine could be patented. This meant that if you made the medicine another way, you could do it. You could freely make the medicine and you could sell it. But after the 1980s, in a process known as the Punta del Ust uh, uh, the Uruguay Round, it was known as the Uruguay Round, of the General Agreement of Trade and Tariffs. The meeting was at Punta del Este in Uruguay. In the 1980s, they changed intellectual property rights, the law. And they said, no longer will you have process patents. Now the product will be patented. The final product will be patented. This meant that even if I made something, a medicine in my own way, I would have to pay rent to the big monopoly company, often based in Europe and so on. So this change of intellectual property meant that for many companies, their intellectual property was the way in which they made money. You might know that Apple, Apple computers, some of you are watching this on an Apple computer. Apple computers don't make computers. It's a Taiwanese company based in China called um, Foxconn that makes most of the components of the computer. Apple merely designs computers, has a brand and sells computers in, in, in the sense that they are a designing company and, and a brand and, and they advertise. They make, they lift up their brand for their computer, but they don't manufacture the computers. That's made by Foxconn. If you own a pair of Nike shoes, for instance, Nike doesn't make any shoes. Nike designs shoes and Nike sells shoes. It's Indonesian subcontractors, Malaysian subcontractors, Vietnamese subcontractors, subcontractors in South America that make the shoes. Nike makes no shoes. So these big monopoly firms, because of the new intellectual property rules, essentially didn't need to manufacture. They outsourced all manufacturing. So this is the idea of globalization. Globalization relies for the massive profit intake by these monopoly, monopoly firms, globalization relies on intellectual property rights. In other words, the entirety of Western capitalism has come to rely on its intellectual property superiority. That means its superiority of advanced technology, including not so advanced technology, like how to make a shoe. But generally advanced technology, particularly in computerization, in telecommunications, and so on. This is what they rely on for their economic superiority. It's a very important component of their gross domestic product, the firms of Silicon Valley and so on, like Alphabet, Google, Netflix, and so on. These companies are a large part of US gross domestic product. 
last two years, the Chinese have both registered more patents in the World Intellectual Property Organization than any other country in the world. They, for the first time, registered more patents than the United States. And in the last two years, Chinese scientists have published more scientific articles in refereed scientific journals than uh, academics from any other country in the world, including, of course, the United States. So for the first time, Chinese scientists and technologists are demonstrating the, a kind of independence and a kind of advance. This is a very serious thing that's been happening from China, and it's not looked at carefully enough. The United States is perfectly aware that if China, particularly in telecommunications, leaps over Western science and technology, Chinese firms, some of them government firms, will have one or two generations of advantage over the United States. And that is the reason why the United States government has gone so viciously against Huawei and ZTE, ZTE, because they manufacture 5G. They manufacture, among other things, telecommunications tools. And they are manufacturing telecommunications tools that are light years ahead of what American companies and European companies are making, like Nokia. One of the reasons why American telecommunications companies haven't been able to make advances is when they deregulated telecommunications in the United States, telecommunications monopolies broke up, they began to compete with each other, and they began to cease to develop the next generation of technology. They were not investing enough money in science and tech, whereas the Chinese invested an enormous amount of money in science and tech. That's why the fault line, you know, when you have an earthquake, two tectonic plates run, the fault line of this clash between the United States and China is in telecommunications, because there the Chinese are def definitely ahead of the United States. But it's not just telecommunications. It's in robotics. It's in different kinds of new forms of energy. It's in mapping technology, G um, the GPS technology and so on. Chinese have made new and much more advanced forms of technological developments. Okay. So that's the part about globalization. Globalization weakened the West, ironically, in terms of science and technology, because the Chinese developed their own pathway after 1978 to develop a state interventionist form of advanced development that led to these, um, these growth areas for them. Okay, now the hybrid war. Lao, we're okay on time? 10, 12 minutes more? Let's see. The hybrid war. Again, please go to the Tricontinental website and you'll find in Spanish, in English, in Portuguese and so on, a dossier we did on the hybrid war against Venezuela. Because it's a very good, it's a dossier written by our office in Buenos Aires and the office in Sao Paulo. It's a really good explanation of what the hybrid war is. And you should really read it because it will give you a sense of the hybrid war against Venezuela, which is pretty fierce. But I want to use this concept regarding China. So I'm talking about now two different things. One is, well, first I should define hybrid war. A hybrid war is a full spectrum war, a war by a, a country against another country or a group of countries against a country which is not necessarily a conventional war, a bombing raid, a shooting war, soldiers crossing the border and so on. The instruments of a hybrid war include economic warfare, financial warfare, diplomatic warfare, information warfare, and so on. There are different kinds of ways of putting pressure on a country. Iran, Venezuela, these countries are experiencing a very severe form of hybrid war led by the United States government, but not just the US and its allies, you know, Canada and so on. Against China, it's, it's very interesting. And I'm going to again talk about economic uh, hybrid war, economic aspect of it, and the information aspect of it. Economic. You see, what the United States understands is that 5G 
because the Chinese are more advanced and because they're able to very competently and relatively inexpensively come into countries around the world, including Argentina and, you know, whether it's Zambia and other countries, and they can provide the next generation of essentially internet, which can help produce the internet of all things, you know, where you have internet in all kinds of aspects of life. They're very highly sophisticated and fast internet, and they can provide it quite reasonably. No US company can compete at this moment with Huawei, ZTE, and so on. Nobody can. Nokia cannot, which is Northern European company. They, they are advanced in telecommunications, but they can't compete with Huawei. Not a chance. So the United States has gone after Huawei in a major way. The chief financial officer of Huawei, the daughter of the founder, was flying from China to Latin America. She was coming to South America to have discussions with governments to talk about Huawei in South America. She was arrested in Vancouver airport by the Canadian government because they accused her of all kinds of nonsense. They are holding her in Canada pending extradition to the United States. But she was on her way to South America because she was coming to South America, coming here to sell Huawei's 5G technology for South America, but they didn't want that. They, were, they are using a form of economic warfare, extra economic warfare, lawfare as well, a court case against the chief financial officer of Huawei to prevent Huawei from having basic commercial interactions with other countries. What are they saying? They are saying Huawei has a close relationship with the Chinese government and your privacy is at stake. They will steal your data and give it to the Chinese government. This is, by the way, speculation. Meanwhile, we already have evidence from Edward Snowden, who was in Hong Kong. He was a contractor in the American National Security Agency. In Hong Kong, he met a series of investigative journalists. He handed over US government information and then he went to Russia, where he talked more about what he had experienced. And he revealed data, documents from the US government about the National Security Agency of the United States, which actually spies using American um, you know, uh, internet companies like Alphabet, Google, and so on. They actually collect data from these companies. They have operations that they're actually running. It's not a speculation. We have evidence that US companies are actually handing over data to the United States government, to the National Security Agency. So here's the United States coming to you in South America and elsewhere and saying, be careful of Huawei because this Taiwan-based company might give your information to the Chinese government. But uh, US companies are already giving information to the US government. So somehow we are so gullible and so silly that we believe that, oh my God, let's be afraid of Huawei. It might give our data. Meanwhile, we're perfectly happy right now with our data being given by these companies to the US government. But they've done a very effective information war to convince people to be scared of the Chinese government and not the US government. I'm frankly much more terrified of Donald Trump, Mike Pompeo, Mike Pence, these gangsters than of anybody else on the planet right now. But somehow they've been able to convince us that China is more dangerous because this company might give, I want you to be very clear about this, no evidence that Huawei is giving the data, but we have evidence that American companies are giving the data. Okay, so they're going in a heavy economic warfare telling countries you must break with Huawei because they are afraid to actually compete with them on commercial grounds. Why not have a free market in 5G? They are actually afraid of the free market because they are going to be superseded by many generations. Now they are saying we won't allow chip manufacturers to supply Huawei. The Chinese have put in billions of dollars now to develop Chinese chip manufacturing and soon won't need American companies. Okay, now information war, the coronavirus. I want you to go again to the Tricontinental website. These are all the footnotes. Go to the Tricontinental website. We have a document called China and Corona Shock. I'd like you to read that because we argue against the information warfare that says that this is a virus which should be known as the China virus. Or, you know, they have some other racist ways of talking about the virus, the Chinese suppressed information and so on. It's all untrue. This was a novel coronavirus. That's why the name is novel coronavirus, a new coronavirus. 
that came in and you know has uh, you know it is nothing to do with the chinese but they are blaming it on china also they are inflaming public opinion around the world saying look at what's happening in xinjiang now i want to pause i have 2 minutes so i'm going to use a minute on this xinjiang the united states government which has destroyed iraq which doesn't care about the palestinians which is trying to destroy iran which murdered afghanistan the united states government which bombed the only pharmaceutical factory in sudan because bill clinton was facing a scandal with monica lewinsky this is the muslim world by the way the united states government which overthrew a government in libya this is the muslim world suddenly becomes the champion of muslims in xinjiang the uyghurs of china and you believe them you say wow the us government is for human rights of the uyghurs in china seriously you're seriously going to accept what the us state department is saying look at it for yourselves look at what's happening in the i don't have time to get into this but all i want to say is this is part of the sustained information war part of the hybrid war against china in the last minute imperialism hybrid war socialism globalization these are the kinds of terms i've tried to explain to you in this half an hour using the example of the us imposed hybrid war on china but you can do something about it you are militants you need to be out there campaigning against this war go to the website nocoldwar.org it's very important there's a statement there against the imposition of this war we don't need this war right now we need to spend our entire energy tackling the pandemic which is a pandemic of the coronavirus a pandemic of inequality and unemployment a pandemic of gender violence and a pandemic of hunger we are facing real crises in the world people are actually dying of hunger v patriarchal violence has increased all across the planet these are real crises this us attack on china is a false crisis it's a crisis not for humanity but it's a crisis for american capitalism don't be drawn into a war on behalf of american capitalism take your energies and try to prevent the crisis of hunger that's where our life that's where our commitments must rest thanks a lot Thanks to you Vijay, muchas gracias por Thank you so much Vijay for your presentation that are always very clarifying and that um drive us to advance in the struggle. And the principal reason to do this sem the seminar is always great to t talk and to speak, but the priority is to, you know, train us even more to be able to transform this world this world that we need. Thank you so much Vijay. And I have the honor to present the comrade Mirel Fanon, who is a comrade from France, who's an activist. From, she's the uh, daughter of the celebrated uh, thinker Franz Fanon that many of us know, and that even the Tricontinental published a dossier about the thinking of Franz Fanon. And she has written many articles about um, human rights, about international human humanitarian law. and about discrimination and also about uh, coloniality of the power and the being. And so we want to uh, reiterate this again, and that thank you so much for being here with us. It's really an honor to have you here in this, in this launch of the seminar. And who could do it better than you to talk about the decolonial thought and the very importance of talking about this decolonial struggle. Thank you so much. Um, your microphone is is off. It's okay. Yes, okay. Okay, good. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Laura. Thank you for your uh, board, and um, thank you to the seminar to organize such uh, uh, such uh, reflection on geopolitics, coloniality, and uh, liberation. And thank you. Uh, Vijay for your presentation your broad and but very uh, explicit presentation thank you i will try to do 
to be in your uh, feet, to continue your thinking. Thank you, and thank you to the translator. I'm sorry to have sent my presentation a little bit later, but um, it was a uh, lot of things to do. And uh, as it is in English, uh, it's not my mother tongue. Uh, I will read my paper to be sure um, I don't miss something. And uh, I'm speaking on the behalf of the France Fanon Foundation. And uh, we are living today in a world where the international order has been shaped by 500 years of Western white hegemony. This economic, political, and uh, civilizational hegemony was formed over genocide, conquest, the transatlantic trade slave, and enslavement. It has been maintained through colonialism and imperialism, speaking both against the people and against the population from north to south. The violent process of subjugation of non-European population has been accompanied by the development of a set of justifying discourses which will naturalize domination through racialization. The white race and its supremacy will be invented during the constitution of this international order set up by Europe and then by the West in which we still live. The invention of races considered inferior, civilizable and colonizable is developing in this same movement because the Eurocentric world system which will give birth to the contemporary globalized capitalist order is based on a true racial division of labor on a global scale. From 19, from, sorry, from 1492, when Salor and soldier arrived in here to unknown lands, people speaking out against the plundering of their natural resources were slaughtered. Defeated by the harms and junk that they were offered to them, they left and sometimes had no other choice to set up counters with the support of banks, among which we can cite J.P. Morgan Chase, Credit, Credit Suisse, and the Bank of France. The foundation of globalization were laid. The free movement of goods was carried on the baptismal font of capitalism, that of people being regulated by white supremacy. Africans torn from their tribe at the bottom of the holes, status still reserved for them when they want to migrate for reason of war or economic environmental reason. And European colonizer on the bridge of the boat, they could go wherever they want and this possibility is always open to them. Natural resources generate interest and desire because they enrich those who brought them back and they continue to be the issue of power relation, which keeps most of the African people with the approval of the president in submission to the imperialist forces who need African natural resources. No way they will escape them, just like there was no question that they miss a free workforce over which they had the right of life and death. As early as the 15th century, a century that must be identified as that of a great catastrophe, more precisely metaphysical and demographic, the colonizer enslavement, thus authorizing the use of human beings only for the disembodied labor power so that the difference between labor power and labor is annihilated so that the surplus value generates the maximum profit for the colonizer. The capitalist system thus plants its first predatory seeds. The advancement of modern conquest and colonialism involve not only the creation of a geopolitical divide based on metaphysical catastrophe, but also the imposition of ideas, organization, and social structures. In this context, the, plur the plurality of conception of the community and human difference is annihilated, even if in many cases, the success is only partial. Despite this, a global community with similar priorities, perception and desire has emerged, what Sylvia Winter identified as the ethno-class man. 
If the ethnoclassman ruled the body from the 15th century on to ensure its economic power, it has never ceased to do so. One only has to look at the large number of young black of Arab incarcerated to understand that this exponential figure this uh, figure demonstrates that this is a price that the indigenous bodies pay to ensure the ethnoclass man's safety, well-being, but especially freedom. After having guaranteed the enrichment of white people, period of enslavement, and the domination of white supremacy in the cultural, economic, political, legal fields, particularly with regard to human rights, <sighs> Now their security and their right to, to, free circulate, to freely circulate have to be ensured. The dominance paradigm has not changed one iota. It is colonial, deeply violent, racist, racializing, dehumanizing, and inhum inhuman. Capitalism has always assured those who possess the function of domination that they can exercise their control over minds and body without ever having to answer for their crimes, and particularly with regard to the treatment they subjected to black and indigenous people, indigenous bodies. Thus bearing on the baptismal front structural racism, one of the colonial expression on which is the coloniality of being over non-being. So racist European political and cultural model will invite the rest of the world, the country of the global south will be established as a reservoir of raw materials and not being treated as a commodities, more preciously as movable property as it is stipulated in the black code. When we speak of enslavement, we speak of dehumanization, denial of the right to life, loss of identity in the name of supposed white superiority. We are talking about a body that no longer belongs to the one who inhabits it and lives it. Even after the abolition, this relationship to the other has never ceased to be crossed by the indignity carried by the supporter of the ideology based on structural racism. Let's stop being naive and understand that the capitalist system we live in was born out of the division of humanity imposed by the ideology of race as a social marker. In Libya, when migrants are sold like our ancestors were, it moves for a time, but no one makes sure it does not happen again. A few declarations and always the international institution and the international community, community silence. When human rights Defenders are killed in Colombia more than 200 since the beginning of 2020. The Colombian government takes no action against this act of genocide while the peace agreement was signed. I, I underline it's, uh, it's not only human rights defender, it's Afro-Colombian human rights defender. As if those who think of capitalism still does not see the perverse and deadly link between black and enslaved, between black and race, between black and class, between race and class. From this point of view, contemporary social racial inequalities found in all society of the world are in inextricably linked to an international geopolitical order. The black condition is immediately linked to the position of Africa in the order uh, sorry, in the order of international trade, just as the Muslim condition in the West is directly determined by the relationship, relationship that Western imperialism has with the country of the Muslim world. Here it is over there. They are bombing there, they discriminate here. They kill here and there. Race and racial Domination are geopolitical by nature, and the fight against racializing racism is a fight which, far from being reduced to moral posture for the change of paradigm of the international order, which gave birth to the system of racialism, exploitation, and dehumanization. Social relations structured by race are a reflection of international relation, and their change depends on the change in this international relation. 
racializing racism and imperialism are intimately, intimately linked. Western imperialism is one of the most obvious sides of the defense of white supremacy and the economical and ge geopolitical order that underlies it. Any power that comes to challenge this supremacy is exposed to a violent response and to a cultural, political, economic, military, and even environmental assault. Each political process aimed at a structural change in this situation of domination is fiercely opposed, like the past and present anti-colonial struggle and demand for real reparation for the crimes against humanity that constitute enslavement of black, body, of black people. It is clear that at present, no multilateral institution addresses the issue of reparation for crimes against humanity and genocide committed during the transatlantic trade slave, enslavement, colonization, and colonialism. State know well that seeking reparation for these crimes or accepting that organization or state seek them would force them to question the structure of the dominant system, which in the white liberal capitalist system is totally impossible. That's why there is a consensus to keep the reparation process out of the political arena. We can also go further in the reflection of this world order, which claims law and order to maintain power. The same type of consensus exists with regard to structural and systemic racism, which is preempted by a moral and empathic anti-racist positioning, while everyone, as long as we are honest, admits that, no, that to eradicate this type of racism, we must change the paradigm of domination set up during the discovery. Let us return to the question of reparation. In the report request by the president of the French Republic, restoring African heritage, toward a relation ethics, the editor identify at least one good reason for addressing the issue of reparation. I quote, it is not only objects that have been taken, but energy, creative resources, deposit of potential forces, forces of generation, of figure and alternative forms of reality, powers of germination. This loss is immeasurable because it's result in an irremediably burned type of relationship and mode of participation in the world, unquote. By enslaving, dehumanizing, and violating millions of Africans, Europeans have effectively shattered reserve of energy, creative resources, powers of germination of the African continent. It is not a question, not only a question of repairing the crimes, theft, rape, looting, murder, etc. It is also a question of repairing the colonial crime done to human and consequently to humanity. Since that time, humanity has typed over into deadly policy that are found at the geopolitical level in the expression of imperialism and in the daily life of the racialized. We must be aware of this. Even after the abolition, this relationship to the other has never ceased to be crossed by the indignity carried by the supporter of the ideology. The white have lost by enslaving the black of Africa and by killing the native, the meaning of the other, the love of the other. It is not for nothing that Franz Fanon calls for wishes. May I be, I quote, may I be allowed to discover and want man wherever he is. Superiority, inferiority, why not just try to touch the, to touch the other, to feel the other, to reveal the other to me, unquote. As long as our humanity refuses to go through this process, it will be an orphan of itself. We'll try in vain to invent new rights when the essential need is to put an end to the biological racism, which has impacted the deep structure of states, formerly slavers and colonizers. 
structural racism work li works like a system because it is carried by capital and the financialization of the world. This stage of reparation is humanly a necessary step if we want to tackle the question of the human, human and not enemy, where there is no longer any reason to think of the other in terms of hierarchy. And if we want international relations to no longer be hegemonic, but respectful of international law, which is never destructured nor delegitimized by those who consider themselves master of the world. It is clear, therefore, that reparation are a political process, which forces us, us to analyze the funding elements of capitalism and globalization and their consequences on racialized people. If these steps are disqualified, as there is a strong tendency to do so, it's a safe bet that neither education, anniversary dates, nor decolonial works will be enough, not, nor in, in international conference as, as it was in Durban 2001, will be enough to politically delegitimize structural racism. The ideology based on structural racism will continue to irrigate social, cultural, economic, military, and environmental relationships. We must understand that we have gone from the black code to that of the indigenous, then to iniquitous trade agreements or military agreements that allow foreign powers to occupy land to establish their military bases, there without this being challenged except by those who are victims. The closure of the enslavement sequence because the expected profit no longer provides what the state and the slavers hope for open up the door to colonization, a logical continuation of the same system. This system persists and particularly with regard to the invisible and silent black bodies in order to obstruct any possibility of claiming for their right to dignity, but also by the rampant occupation of Africa. To conclude, if we want to put an end to structural and systemic racism as claimed by many rulers, they will, they will seriously have to agree to question the structure of globalization and capitalism in the light of race and class, especially that following the financial crisis of 2008. We understand that capitalism is not the victim of a momentary crisis, but of an internal contradiction, which leads it to its inexorable collapse. We can legitimately wonder if this contradiction is not based on the desire to leave millions of people in the zone of the non being and the refusal to question the, the sources, the basis of capitalism. In this context, one can also wonder about the role played by certain, certain anti-capitalists or certain alter-globalizationists who have never questioned the role of capitalism and globalization in the perpetuation of structural racism, and therefore of the impact of structural racism in maintaining capitalism. We cannot build an alternative to capitalism without addressing the source of structural racism. Can the demand of the black bodies to dignity and life be sufficient to encourage the being to leave the capitalist ideology, which continue to keep the non-being on the side of death? An answered question, which can only be answered if African and Afro-descendant agree to unit in a pan-Africanist decolonial approach to raise the question of political repression and to lay flat that of a human humanity where the universal will have been revisited, not in the light of dominant liberal thought, but in that of dignity from a properly decolonial perspective. But more and more, it seems that this goal can only be achieved if the African continent is freed from the colonial yoke that has never ceased to strangle it in its murderous and predatory tentacle. It will also be necessary to question space like that of the United Nations where the coloniality of power and being is expressed at all levels, both among UN officials and members of the international community. 
The actual episode of the pandemic is exemplary. In this context, the coercitive measure emanating most of the time from a strong state punishing a weak state and eating the most vulnerable of peoples have not been called into question. Neither the embargo, nor the economic sanction, nor the blockade have been abandoned or at least been subject to a moratorium. These retaliatory measures are the expression of a balance of power in favor of the dominant state, which violated the international obligation of state by contradicting international legality, de facto the embargo does not comply with the UN Charter. It should be noted, noted that state imposing or allowing the embargo or blockade or economic sanction are failing in their obligation to protect fundamental rights. Given the importance of the right in question, all states, absolutely all states, should affirm that they have a legal interest in this right being protected. The obligation in question being the omnes obligation. It cannot be ignored that the United Nations has resigned from its obligation to ensure international peace and security, mainly because it has contributed to the violation of the preemptory norms of international law and above all, because it plays a role of a drive of political, ideological, and economic model, which aim at the establishment of an international order based on racialization, forced violence, subjugation of people, even if its ethno-class men are fear the contrary. Therefore, in the, fa in the face of legally organized exclusion, in the face of an order of misery, in the face of policies for the destruction of, of people's rights and human rights. It is imperative to rebuild an international order not based on the reason of, of force and private interest, but international cooperation, multilateralism. But is this, is this the best decolonial way? It is a question. In conclusion, if we, claim, if we claim to carry the values of political anti-racism, then it is imperative to admit that coloniality expressed in the different form of negrophobia is structural racism and is the most violent, the most central expression and the most obvious of dehumanization. If the end of the racial world order involves the liberation of the South, the liberation of Africa is a condition for the liberation of the black people, which will be that of all humanity. Thank you. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Mirel, por tu Thank you so much, Mirel, for your intervention and your clarities. We're going to take advantage to Thank to all of the hundreds of people that are watching the transmission on different channels, on different social media, on different spaces that are organizing. We also thank the questions. And unfortunately for the, the amount and the, and the people who are part of the presentation, um, there won't be space for this, these questions. But now we're going to go to our third panelist, it also doesn't require a presentation, but we're going to do the formality. Is Enrique Dusil. He's from Mexico. He's one of the founders of the Theology of Liberation. He's been working in the constru political construction. He's, he studied in the International Vallecucho. Also studied in the University of Madrid. He is PhD in story, history from Paris. He has been received awards from many different universities. He has written more than 50 books and more than 400 articles. So he is one of the most important philosophers in Latin America of the um, 20th and 21st century. So thank you so much, Enrique. We give you the time to speak. 
And how can I make sure that people from France and India can understand Spanish? <laughs> Have you thought about a translation? Yes, all of this is guaranteed. We have two channels, one in English and one in Spanish. Okay. I'm <laughs> Okay, I can't, can't translate from French. <laughs> so the topic that I'm going to be discussing today, which is about philosophy and geopolitics, was from the beginning, there in the end of the 60s, in the 20th century, this was one of the first topic that we should have been discussing because the question in 69 and 70, the same question that we were asking was if there exists a philosophy in Latin America, and there was a debate that was very well known between Salazar, a Peruvian thinker, and a Mexican thinker. And I was also part of this debate in those years. And so we were discussing if there was a Latin American philosophy. So Salazar Bondi, he said that since we were dominated, what we did was repeat the philosophy, uh, the Eurocentric philosophy. And then in, the Mexican thinker had defended that we did have our own philosophy because the philosophy is universal. And so there we began a group of us of young people in Argentina thinking that if there was a, a topic to think about originally, it was why do we not have a, our own philosophy? Because in reality, we had been repeating the philosophy from Europe, from North America, and we didn't express our own position. And so in this time, we talked about the center of Europe, of the United States, and then we talked about the peripheries. So the colonial periphery of Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And so quickly we began to discover that the coloniality of Latin America had five centuries because the, the Spanish had come to the Caribbean at the end of the 15th century. And so while they arrived to Asia after, you know, they were touching a bunch of, there was not a full continental invasion in Asia. And there wasn't a full continental invasion in Africa until the 19th century. So in Latin America, it had five centuries of colonialism. And in Africa, and in the Berlin Congress in 1880s, at the end of the 19th century, was when it was in, invaded by the Europeans in the Congress that was held in Berlin. And that's where they divided up Africa. And in Asia, it began to be continentally occupied at the end of the 18th century with the occupation of India. But it hadn't been since the 15th century like in Latin America. So what we realized and what we call philosophy of liberation is from an origin, it's from its beginning it proposed the topic and the idea of if it was possible to think about from a colonial world. But we didn't talk about the topic of colonialism like today it's discussed. And I want to describe how this topic became out of the decolonization, of the epistemological decolonization which has been something that has been universalized in this moment. So actually yesterday, the day before yesterday on Tuesday, uh, we were on a Zoom call and someone was defending a, a PhD thesis in, in Paris and a professor in Belgium that had directed the uh, thesis. So there was one French person 
and I was a Mexican in the tribunal and the student was from Colombia. And so we held this, this meeting on Zoom, the discussion of the doctoral thesis and the approval of this thesis. That was very interesting because it was a very interesting moment and event. And the student, the Bogota student in Paris did a very excellent thesis about the passage of the conquistador. And I think in the, I think in French was one of the first theses that we defended in the liberation philosophy in the beginning of the 70s. And we gave importance to the 16th century because in Europe and the United States and in all of the universities of the world, uh, the French philosopher who wrote the speech of the method in Amsterdam in 1623 was one of the greatest modern philosophers. But we criticized this position and we said, no, the philosophy, modern philosophy was born in the Caribbean. And this was a little uh, unsettling for many people. And this was a, something that I was just working with 19 years ago in the Philosophical Association of the Caribbean. And I said that in the Caribbean, philosophy, modern philosophy began. And why do I say this? Because the Europeans who were surrounded by the Muslim world and the Arab world and concretely the Ottoman Empire could not go outside of these walls outside of the Islamic world. And the only thing that they had was the Atlantic. And this is why Columbus un unexpectedly landed in, in the Americas without knowing. And he thinks that it's part of Asia. And the four travels, the trips of Columbus, he doesn't do it in the Caribbean, but he's in some very confused Southern Sea of China. And this is why Columbus did not discover China, but he always imagined that he was in China because Latin, South America was drawn as a, a big peninsula to the south of China in a map of from 1487 from Enrique Martello that put South America south of China because of the discoverments and the Chinese discovered America much before the Spanish and the, cart uh, the cartography and the maps that they made in, in Venice, they put South America as a fourth peninsula of Asia, south of China. So they had the Arabic Peninsula, the Indian Peninsula, the Indochina Peninsula, and a fourth peninsula that was south of China. And so it was a cartographic error that put South America south of China. So Columbus, when he arrived to the Caribbean, we have arrived to the east. And this is why he called Indians indigenous people. What he called indigenous people in Indian. And in his fourth um, trip, he arrived to Panama and he discovered the Pacific Ocean. And so he wrote in his diary and his travel journey, we are 10 days away from, um, from the Ganges River. So we're 10 days away in boat from the river Ganges. But he was in Panama and so he didn't know the existence of the Pacific Ocean. So America wasn't in the world. Spain uh, arrived to America. And so for me, 1492 is the origin, origin of modern modernity, of capitalism, and of colonialism. 
and of Eurocentrism. Simultaneously, the four phenomena are happening at the same time. And this is why it's necessary to think in this topic of this geopolitics of what we call the decolonial change and shift, because that's where the European colonialism began in 1492. And so this student in France now, on Thursday, he had compared the, the fact, of, the practical fact of colonizing America, that one century after Descartes, Descartes had thought, I think, but this is founded in the I, I conquest and I produce colonies. And then in 16th century, philosophy begins. And so this is seen as a, a post stage from the medieval period. But in the 16th century, Bartolome de las Casas, he discusses the philosophical theme. He first talks about indigenous people. He talks about indigenous peoples and they talk about how they're humans, he asks. So he says they are human, but they're second class. And that's where racism began. And they also asked, do they have, does Europe have the right to conquest these, these lands? And Bartolome de las Casas, he criticized the conquest. But in reality, he ex it was accepted massively doing the conquest in itself. But and they even thought that it was a benefit for the indigenous people to receive the impact of the European civilization because then they would be developed. And so in the 16th century, there is no history of philosophy. The faculty of philosophy does not exist in the whole world in this moment, not only in Europe and North America, but in Africa and in Asia, in Latin America. No, they did not. It's not studied as this, this century and that racism is installed in, in philosophy because they call the indigenous of the inferior race. But qu not quickly was this topic decided. But in Latin America, we focus a lot on the indigenous. But of course, this morning in a program on Zoom also with a journalist, very well-known journalist in Mexico, we talked about the uh, decolonial shift. And so we had a dialogue with Maldonado Torres, who is a Spanish professor in New York, and he has worked a lot on the topic of the decolonial shift in the Caribbean. He is from Puerto Rico, and so he discusses this, this issue. And so he's, something he says is interesting, which is the following. He attacks in a certain way the thinkers from Latin America that have a American centricity because they don't take on the issue of the Caribbean and principally of Haiti. So right now I want to refer to this discussion. The decolonization emerges not only in Latin America, but first and foremost in the Caribbean. And the, uh, the daughter of the great Frans Fanon, who's here with us, was part of this discovery. And so in the Caribbean was where the largest population of slaves from Africa was brought to. And so in the 20th century, Marxism from the Caribbean used Marx in order to interpret the reality of the Caribbean. And in a certain way, it criticizes the traditional Marxism of the struggle, the class struggle, which is of course realized, but they said in reality, the class struggle historically received the aspect of a race struggle 
And the way to classify humans was first in um, whiteness and the white race, and then the other races of not whiteness, and especially the black African, that those from Africa had had in Africa and had devalued. And then they brought as slaves to the Caribbean. So the intellectuals from the Caribbean have discussed the, issue, the topic of race as one of the central issues, not only of the classification, social classification, but also of the liberation. And the liberation began by overcoming uh, slavery. So they bring this, this topic that's very interesting of a Caribbean Marxism that has a t pays attention to racism. And so that from the Caribbean, Aníbal Quijano from Peru, from an indigenous country. And so he's come with Wallerstein. They discuss this and I was part of this discussion. And Aníbal Quijano also applies the category of race not only for the uh, topic of race in the Caribbean, but he brings it to the indigenous America. And he says that in also in Latin America, um, the indigenous, the South part of America is also classified socially by race. And so in this line of thought, the topic has emerge of the coloniality of, of power, which was a new philosophical topic that brings together a group of philosophers, Aníbal Quijano. I was also part of this in Berkeley, Arthur Mignolo, and there were many other comrades and colleagues. And this was emerging the concept of the necessity of the decolonization because we have done a first emancipation, a political emancipation in Latin America in the beginning of the 19th century. And in India, for example, and in Africa, in this 20th century itself. However, we continue with a colonial mentality, repeating the, the theories, the philosophy of Europe and the United States. And we have not began our own thought. And so this is why there's a this decolonization, epistemological decolonization. And I would also call it a philosophical decolonization. We, all, we have to think about everything from new. And we have to think that the modernity begins with the invasion of America in 1492 and later in the invasion of Africa and Asia. And this modernity begins with the accumulation of the silver taken out of the mines in Mexico and in Boli from Bolivia. And think now about the Potosí mine in Bolivia of the Aymara indigenous people. There were 20 million tons of silver in the, in the 16th century only. So they took the silver and the Europeans had the um, accumulation in this moment, the prim primitive accumulation. So in the discovery of America, which was not the discovery, but an invasion, but at the same time, beginning to think about Europe as a center of the story, which had not been thought of before. And this is this is product of the invasion of America, the Eurocentric ideology that Descartes will later, one century later, after a debate in Spain and Portugal, will come to France and Germany, one century later, after Spain. And at the same time, this capitalism is colonialist. And so all of these things were very important to discuss philosophically, and not any other European or North American philosophy had discussed these topics. 
And so this is what Aníbal Quijano talks about the coloniality of power that has transformed the epistemological coloniality and the philosophical coloniality. And as such, it calls on us to begin a process of creating of our own autonomous creation, of our own philosophical discourse, and so on. 1970 appears in the first groups of this group in Buenos Aires and a small manifesto of the editorial where I write a small manifesto, a manifesto of the liberation philosophy. And today we're 50 years later. And however, this is discovered clearly that it, that it was bringing up something that had never been said because it was original from Latin America and it had to be developed. And now we've been working for 50 years of developing philosophically that is decolonized because it takes as a starting point, not the story of the Greeks, of the Middle Ages and Talk, and of course, people in Thomas of Canino. And then we're thinking about Kant, Marx, Heidegger. We talk about how in 16th century, a distinct philosophy was emerged from Spain, where they proposed this idea that the, the colonization is just, the colonization of America is just. And so in this, so there was a criticism to the modern project. And so the virus, the COVID-19 virus has put into question all of modernity, it has questioned neoliberalism and the hegemony of the market over the state and many questions that sounds like the end of modernity. However, the end of North American hegemony is because now the United States is the greatest hegemonic power, but of course another power has emerged in the, in the east of China. And so there's a, a new geopolitical scene that's emerging. And so we have to know how to situate ourselves in this new global position. It is no longer the Soviet Union, that was still a, a country of the Eastern Europe, but now there is a power from Asia that does not have anything that's from Europe. And it has a long history of science, of technology that's from China itself. In the second century, the Chinese uh, discovered steel. And so it's very interesting to look at the swords of steel and they did not know why but they were much better of iron than the iron ones. And so this was passed to the Philippines and they brought the swords and the barks and the boats to Manila, which was a, a Spanish colony. And it, and it was brought to Acapulco in Mexico and then to Spain. And Acapulco was in the center of the world because it was between the Pacific and the Atlantic. And then it lost its centrality when the Atlantic was able to recover its centrality, which is lost again because the his history is moving towards Asia and towards the Pacific. And so now it's very important to keep in mind where we're starting from, our starting point. And our starting point is a place. It is a geography. It is a story, a history, and it's a culture. And it's a people, and it's the day-to-day -day reality. For a Latin American, reality is Latin America. For someone from India, it's India. For someone from Africa, it's Africa. For someone from China, it's China. And philosophy must begin from there and begin to think. And so this is what we're doing here in Latin America for the first time. So it's no longer only citing European authorities, but beginning to cite and quote each other 
between each other and talking about our own realities. So right now I'm doing a course on aesthetics, which seems like something abstract, far from politics, far from economy and geopolitics. So I took a very big book of 800 works, <laughs> words, uh, pages, which is the aesthetics of Hegel. And I did all of my, my classes, 20 classes, on how does Hegel see aesthetics. It was very impressive. All of the cultures have art, but they have symbolic art, primitive art like in Egypt. And classic art is Greek, is Greece. And then you have the German, and you have, all of this is based in Greek art. And then there's Romanticism. And the Romanticism is uh, Christian and it's German and it's the combination of the history of art. And what does this talk about China? It doesn't say anything. What does it talk about in terms of India? Nothing, it doesn't even reference it. And Latin America doesn't even exist. So I discussed this text and now I'm working um, an aesthetics of liberation. And I begin from Hegel and I say, Hegel has a very Eurocentric view of aesthetics, even in terms of beauty is European. But of course, now I have to begin to propose a new definition. And there aren't many about beauty, for example, and then show beauty as a totality of a t culture. And then the hegemonic beauty and the dominating beauty and the coloniality of beauty in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Because you can think that in Africa there would have been art. We forget that, that Egyptians are African and that they were the uh, mother country of, of Greece. And we forget that the Africans have amazing dances, uh, incredible rhythm with which all of the youth in the world dance to because the dance of the slaves in the Caribbean goes to, to the United States and the jazz in the United States is what today the youth dance to in China and in India and in Russia and Africa, of course, because that's where it was originated in Europe and all over, and of course in the United States. And so how they're going to say that Africa did not contribute to the history, to the global history. And so today all of the youth dance to an African rhythm in, in music to just give a small example of the aesthetics. So I wanna say is that we have to rethink from our own spaces, from our own history, of course, from the our own history to rediscover our significance and then discovering philosophy again from anthropology, metaphysics, all of these different aspects of philosophy and also the aesthetic and, other, and many other parts. The feminism, for example, thinking about um, the women and the exercise of other genders that is not only masculine and feminine, but there are many others. And how is this experience in different cultures expressed? So I want to say that we're in a stage of re-proposing and rethinking philosophy itself from what we call the locus. We're going to use a foreign word, <laughs> the, the place of where something is announced, the, where the speech is announced. So I come from Latin America and I think of my reality. And that's where I enter into di dialogue with other aspects. So I have to restart to do a shift, a decolonizing shift. So there's a linguistic shift, there's a paradigmic shift. We talk about a lot of shifts, but about the decolonizing shift means stopping to be a colony, to no longer stop taking the European and North American authors as the starting point of thinking 
all of us, when we see the philosophy magazines and the works, they're all European authors. And, and I am there with Foucault. And, and then where, where are the Latin Americans in this? And what do you know about Mexico? And they don't even know about Mexico. They just only know the European thinkers for ignorance. And here I have a small book. It's a book that has 1,030 pages. It has two columns. Very, very small words. So there are a thousand, 2,400 pages, really, at the end. And it's called Philosophical Thought, Latin American Philosophical Thought from the Caribbean and Latin. From, from 1,000 to 2,000. And they say there's no Latin American philosophy, but they should look at this book that weighs two kilos. And then later, they can tell me if there is or not. Because the part in that the end is the curriculum of the most recent authors. We selected 300 Latin American philosophers from Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, Paraguay, Uruguay, and the Caribbean. And then also Latin Americans from the United States. And so we, we began from the Amautas, Peruanos, and from the uh, Aztec empires and the, and the Tupi Guarani in Paraguay and all of the indigenous peoples in the Amazons. And how did they not have philosophy? They had visions of the world, they had many myths. And today, those can still be read and think, thought about and assumed, and taken on. And this is very important what the Tupi Guarani people were thinking about where life, people talk about the Guaranis who don't have houses because it seems like a very primitive culture. However, I say that I received the people from the, the gods, or so we can say from nature. And as such, born from, but know about how, what Kierkegaard thought. But in, but the way that you can say that I receive life, I receive, so I am in debt to a, a owner. And the only way to pay, repay the owner of life who received this without merits. So which one of you should have been given life? I always ask my students that. And they say, what? And they look at me and they scratch their heads. I, I deserved life because, so it's ridiculous to say that you deserved life because life, I received life at the beginning of my life. So how do I repay the, the owner? And I do this by doing an act of donation. And so they had a economy that was based on this, that you had to donate. And the, and whoever had uh, received a donation had to give another donation to another. So no, it is a, it's not an economy of selling and buying, but it's an economy of donating and then being responsible of fulfilling this donation to another person. So the Guarani people, when the Spanish came, um, they gave them food to eat, and, they, and the Spanish said, oh, look at these dumb Indians who gave us food to eat that for free. But at the next harvest, the Guaranis said to the Spanish, okay, so you guys ate the um, fruits of the land, and now you have to eat with us in order to produce a new harvest. 
and then the Spanish were not in agreement. And so the indigenous people said, who, who are these people? They're irrational. They are crazy. How can they receive a donation and then they don't think to give it back? So it was another economy, another way of organization. And these uh, Jesuit reductions in Guarani was the only uh, socialist uh, system in the modernity. And the Jesuits organized in Paraguay and also in Venezuela. And then from where socialism, socialism began to emerge. And then socialism. So socialism originated among the Tupi Guaranis in America, Latin America. So this is a very interesting story. And there we have philosophy of the thinkers that called Amauta Peruan of the different Aztec peoples. And then we can continue talking about this philosophy. And all this just to say that we have to first take on our own philosophy and think about our own philosophy. And then we have to innovate today. I say the philosophy of liberation that we call it innovates everything. All of the topics that we discuss, we can never repeat them because we have to think from ourselves and from thinking it from ourselves. So there the first thing to do is decolonize. Stop having, always praising the uh, European and North American thinking and referencing it and seeing our own tradition. And this is what's happening in Africa. We talk about Mbembe, who talks about the necro politics. And the African people are creating a political philosophy that's their own. And you wouldn't even imagine in China. And here we talk, you know, about Fidel Castro because he's a great revolutionary thinker in a small island that has 12, 000, uh, 12 million people. But who of you know about the thinking of a great thinker from China that is today the prime minister, but of uh, 1 billion people is 100 times bigger than Cuba and is socialism in you know, the 21st century. And we don't know them. And we don't know why China has done this revolution. And of course we have to be careful because we have to criticize, but this is a, this is called the Chinese miracle, uh, miracle and we don't, in the second century, for example, it already produced iron. In the fourth century, they discovered paper. And in the 6th century, the Chinese discovered um, printing. And of course, the modernity in North American uh, philosophers say, oh, in, a in 14, they talk about the discovering of the printing press in a, in a German city. And I was there many years ago where the Gutenberg lived. And so in 1486, Gutenberg discovered the printing press, but the Chinese discovered this in the sixth century. So this was not in, in Germany in the 15th century, but it was in the sixth century in China. But the European and the North Americans do not know anything about China. And they think that it's just a barbarous uh, people that have now made some random miracle. But in sixth century, they had printing press. They had paper money, which was a thousand years before Europe had it. So what do you think? We ignore what happens in other cultures because we have, we have been sucking up to and domesticating our, our minds to a Eurocentric thinking. And we must decolonize ourselves and the philosophy of liberation, especially in Latin America, seeks to do this. 
And this is why we can see um, we don't doesn't mean we can we don't have to ignore European thinkers, but we should read it with our Latin American hypothesis. I've read a lot Marx many years, ten years reading the different five different editions of Capital for a seminar in the university. And we realized that Marx is not Stalinist or Soviet. And we saw Marx in a new way, who's very useful in Latin America. And we can say that we can also read other philosophers, but from our perspective. And from there, the issue of racism is fundamental. The topic of the Caribbean is very central. And we have to return to our history in order to see with new eyes than the reality. I am deeply happy and content and excited of what's happening. The failure of neoliberalism in the face of the virus. I don't know if you've seen this, that the virus shows that the countries that seek, seem to be more developed, like the United States, that it does not have a health system, a public health system, because it left it in the hands of the market. And it thought to have a minimum state. So the state has not taken care of the health. The market takes care of the health and private property is who has to organize the struggle against the disease. And of course the poor people cannot pay. And so they die. So in the United States, they have two doctors for every thousand inhabitants. In Cuba, they have nine doctors for a thousand inhabitants. So the small Cuba had thought about a health system in favor of the people. The United States does not have a good health system for the people, but it's for those who can pay. And this is a failure that the virus is showing. The food system, the United States has modified agriculture, the seeds and the vegetables, and it modifies the production, the animal production, the chicken, um, the pigs, the cows, the antibiotics have been used in great numbers, and this produces a virus, and these viruses have attacked us. And, a, and we also eat these animals and these products, and these animal products that then infect our bodies. But, you know, the business works. The increase of the profit margin is the rationality of modern, the modernity since Colon Columbus arrived to America, when he looked for gold, when he was searching for gold, in order to confront the Muslims who were richer and had the connection to Morocco, to Egypt, Afghanistan, Philippines, India. So the Islamic world had the Atlantic and the Pacific, and Europe was cornered in a secondary world in a position it was an ignorant position. They didn't know anything about science or mathematics or economy. And they did not have the wisdom. And that's why our numbers are Arabic numbers. They're not Latin numbers. But the Latin numbers, we cannot do mathematics, cannot multiply. And so the the Arabic world had to, had the Arab world had to invent mathematics. And so this is a very different vision of the world. And I said that I should speak two words and I've already said about 10. So I've taken up some time. But you can read this all because I have written many different works. And I hope that in the seminar, they have you have this geopolitical shift of the crisis of Europe the loss of hegemon, of cultural, and even produ productive hegemony of the United States, even if it 
still has a very strong military power, which is balanced with the, the Russians, but in the productive area, the Ch Chinese are much more advanced. So we have an interesting geopolitical panorama. And so we have to know from our own autonomy and our liberty that they cannot be benefit from. And we should not continue being in the backyard of the United States if we can now have relationships with China that propose to us a new, a new form of relationships. And of course, they have their own interests, but, we're, but we are underestimating them because of our mental colonialism and political colonialism. And it seemed we thought we had been independent of the United States. And, we, and today, they're proposing new projects. And so we need to choose. And the philosophy should help in this process. And really, in this, the philosophy is liberation. And no, not of passive colonialism and acad academia. When, when a philosopher writes articles just to fulfill with their, their points in the university and earn a salary, this is not philosophy. This is corruption of philosophy. The philosophy should be thinking about the real problems of the world. And at the same time, you have to live honestly, of course. And this is what we want. But we have to we have the possibility today of creating all of the new chapters of philosophy. And what I have done is to open up hypotheses. And now the third volume around 1,500 pages, but it's a hypothesis about politics. Um, but it's much more to say about this. And this can do, make the criticism, and I'm going to do the concrete criticism of Macri and Bolsonaro and what happened in Mexico for 30 years that put the country in debt and impoverishment and the masses have very really suffered. And so we need to make sure that the philosophers can, can work and help towards building a new political system with democratic participation, with a state that's very strong, it can help. And now many European authors think that they're, that they're afraid of the state. And we haven't been in it, but since, 1492, we have never had a state of law, a state of law. And so in the colonial rule, they were the ones who, who decided who the authorities were. And then when we were liberated, we, we remained under control of France and England and the United States in the 20th century. Um, the United States was in control of was in control of Latin America. And now for the first time, maybe we can emancipate ourselves as Simón Bolívar would have dreamed and how San Martín also has dreamed and how they gave their light for this. And Usán Louverture in Haiti as well. And the first revolution for emancipation was in Haiti. And this is not in our books, in our Latin American books. And this is why today, Maldonado Torres in his program today said, there's American centricity. And the signal of this is the ignorance towards Haiti. So I said to myself, he's right. There's a comrade who's a philosopher in Brazil, Carlos Bauer, who says, while Haiti is not being studied, we continue to ignore our history. And so I took my book, my very big book, and I said, okay, Haiti, where is it? In four lines of Maldonado Torres, who wrote an article, and Luzano Vertur, a black man in 
African then who liberates Haiti from France and with the declaration of the human rights, he declares the freedom of Haiti in one, um, 1804. And this was way before the Latin Americans. And we talk about the uh, Jamaica letter of Bolivar. And this was supported by the great revolution of Haiti. But this does not appear in the book. And I said, okay, in the new edition, we're going to put Haiti in this book because it showed the importance of the Caribbean as Mireille also discussed to us, which is very important to assume this part of our history. I will end there because it's time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dussel, eh, Professor Dussel, for this invitation to think on our own and also this invitation to share this donation as you explained us. And I think we do this a lot of days in the social militancy that we're all part of it. Thank you so much um, from the Institute in Argentina that helped us have this connection. Hopefully we can have many more exchanges. I think we're going to close with the final conclusions. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much, Lautaro. Thank you, Mireille and Professor Dusit. It's, a, it's an honor to hear from you guys, to exchange with you guys, to learn from you together. And I want to remind everyone before we end, there are many people who are watching us that are even doing it with many challenges of connections. There are people from Cuba who are watching and you know they can't use Zoom. So we did a lot of different transmissions and techniques so they could listen to us and they could participate. So they have sent photos, they have sent many salutes to us and they're very happy to have been listening to us. And it is, you cannot have a better panel to begin this seminar for geopolitics. As Enrique Dussel says, look at Latin America and the Caribbean. So one of the key things that are we having as a challenge in our this process and as the articulation is keeping uh, the awareness on the Caribe, which is a very key part of our history and the Caribbean people and the history of Haiti, as Professor Dussel has said, and remind people who are watching I can see that they're making many comments, very excited to be connected, to talk, to learn together. And I want to comment that all these people, all these people who have been part of this, the first part of our seminar. So this, is, this has been done thanks to a big effort from many comrades who have been prepping for months for this first uh, class, but the 11 that were going to happen until November. And so it's another showing that the political organization is our activity and our commitment to transforming reality that makes this possible and makes all of these areas possible. So in the academy, it has many tools for us, but how can we better understand ourselves than through our militancy in the territories, through our grassroots, and that we have challenges, but we are do we taking on every way possible to be include people into these spaces. And so what we're doing is giving honor to this, this story of resistance in Latin America and the Caribbean and the global South. And so one of the things that we have loved of this seminar is to think about ourselves as people, not only in of, as Latin America and the Caribbean, but also African people, as Asian people and try to think and talk about what is the perspective of the periphery, of the, of the so-called periphery by the uh, liberal academia. And so think of ourselves as our, with our own heads, as Dussel said. And so I wanna thank you again to all of you. It has been an honor in the name of Alba Movements and all of the comrades and from Battle of Ideas, Jose Carlos Mariategui School and of course the Tricontinental Institute for have been creating this experience for all of you. It's an honor for us. And you know that this is going to be uh, recorded on YouTube and it's uh, the English version is on the Tricontinental YouTube. So nothing more than thanking you so much for Mire and Vijay who had to go to another conference. And he said the Zoom communism never ends. 
So it's conference and another conference, but he gives many greetings to Dussel and Mireille. And thank you so much. Uh, we know that you're in Paris and it's very late. And so thank you so much for staying with us. And thank you so much, Professor Dussel. Um, all of the doors of the Latin American movements are open to you. And thank you so much for your wisdom and for your uh, happiness and your memory that you give to us. And so a big hug to everyone. We'll see you next Thursday. And we will be with Atilio Verón. And we'll see you next Thursday to enjoy the next session. Thank you so much. See you later. Ahí nos dice que terminamos primero. ya transmisión. Ahí ya le confirmamos y terminamos transmisión. Pues eh, finalizada la transmisión. Muchísimas gracias. <ríe> Qué honor. <ríe> Estamos muy felices. Muchas gracias a los traductores, no dije al final. Gracias a Sol.